Well, every time I tell a story, I think of the people that told me those stories. And it, it might sound to some people a bit pretentious, but it isn't. Um, I hope that by telling those stories, those people haven't dead as long as I'm telling those stories. And I do think when I'm telling the stories that the person that told me that story, they're still alive. They're still, they're still, by their voice can still be heard, hopefully. Now, the people who are listening to the story won't know that because I might be telling a story in England or Antrim or West Cork or God only knows where. And the, the people hear a story, and a story to them is a story, be it good or bad or enjoyable or what. But I won't be thinking that. I'll be thinking of this fella or that woman or whoever, in, be it Kerry or Lissy Casey or, or God only knows where, Galway, that told me that story. And like I say, while I'm able to tell that story, that person isn't dead. I would hope that from the stories I have got from the old people, something comes across that is better. Because the stories I have got from them, there is something better there. The stories, they had a little bit of nobility in them. Uh, be they fairy stories, be they stories about Jack, you know, the, all the Jack stories, be he Jack a trickster or be he a, a, a tragic figure, because sometimes there was that. Uh, uh, no matter what, no matter what. But they were fun. They passed the night. You could go home at the end of them, feeling in some way uplifted even, because uh, it had passed the night peacefully for you. And if you were quick-witted and if you were intelligent enough, you could always admire the person who had told the stories. Just like nowadays you can admire a good musician. And you can say, yes, look, can that fella handle himself well? And and lots of people do that, you know, they do admire a good musician today, or a good singer. Not so much good storytellers, because there aren't that many around. But that can be when you hear a good storyteller today. And I do occasionally, I have to say, I do occasionally, but not as often as I'd like, because the act has been declining and declining, Partly because of television. It's, we're living in a very strange world. We're going through a very st a strange phase. And you wonder, where do I co how do I come to all of this? I listen to some of the old people. No, no, not some. Practically all of them. And practically all of them are bewildered by the world that they are now sitting in. Because... As I said before, they remember a world where you had to pinch and scratch and save and scrabble. Not save, because there was nothing to save. You just scrabbled by. And they were so thankful to be able to raise those families, mainly for export, nearly all for export. Because I remember uh, what about seven of my father's ten brothers and sisters all to America. My mother's all to England. You know, the, and there's the same with every family, practically in Ireland. They all went. And you say to yourself, why? Why? I remember one man in particular. He, he was a philosopher in his own way. Again, I have a lot of him recorded, and I will do a book on him. I have to. But it won't be, it won't be your ordinary countryman book, because he had... He had, to use an old tired cliche, many strings to his bow. He was he was a man who had seen the troubles. He was a, he was a, a, he was member of the board of conservators. He was a fisherman. He was he was several things like that. Uh, he was a mill owner. He was ah oh, he he was a, an incredible old man, and <laughs> a man of great sense of humour. He could tell you in the town where he was who used to go around collecting the shit. And uh, he always asked me, please, you know, don't mention because the family. He says they made a lot of money out of it and they're quite prosperous now. No, but he said nothing to be ashamed of. Nothing to be ashamed of. 
He said, you know, many families came up that way. And he said the, the shit was all dumped in a certain place and it made grand ground eventually. You know, and, but, you know, made fine ground. Prosperous, prosperous people they turned out to be. And they'd collect your shit for a penny a bucket. You know, when there was no toilets in, in the town. That's where, just like you'd be collecting your rubbish now. Otherwise it went into the river. And it did no harm, he said. Uh, fish love shit. Human shit. But if you wanted to be respectable and have it collected, you know, collected by the bucket. But once again, you know, the idea nowadays that people would admit that, that they furtively by night went down and dumped their shit into the river. But oh, everybody had to do that. But see, that kind of thing, you know, straight out, straight out. Don't forget this nonsense about Ireland was an ideal place. Everybody has to shit. Yeah, so I said, if you can't shit, you wouldn't see this trouble. And he'd be, you know, he'd put it down. I remember when he'd be telling me that. <laughs> he'd come straight off with it. He said, when did you shit last? You have to shit, he said. You know, and he'd, you know, and he'd, he had a way about him of saying it. You know, that, that, uh, and he told me a story one time about this woman. And she was a very, very fancy woman. You know, always dressed up to the nines. And she went into this pub... Uh, it was a, it was a, no women normally used to go into pubs, they go into the snug. But uh, there was the, the man who owned the pub, he, he could get argumentative. But there was some argument during this wedding anyway, and uh, the woman and himself got into an argument, the barman. <laughs> and that's what it came down to eventually. It was an argument about the, the price of drinks or something that she wasn't paying for them, but the person that she was with was paying for them and wasn't paying for them. But eventually it came down to a case of uh, that uh, he, uh, to the woman, would haul her finery um, he got quite over the counter. He said, he said, do you shit or don't you? <laughs> do you shit or don't you? That's what it came down to, you know, with the price of the drink. Do you shit or don't you? You know, and that brought her back down to earth very quickly. And you know, with all her mm, fancy, 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 and that she had the four and all on her and the high heels. But, you uh, yeah, know, like the rest of us, in the case of, you know, you're like the rest of us. But, uh, yeah, he was a very funny man. Those are the kind of stories he had. But he had many more as well about fishing and the rest of it and the War of Independence. And he was one of the ones who saw bodies after an ambush. So... I spent many, many hours with him um, when he was on his deathbed in the hospital. I I was there too. Because like I said, with these people, you can't just go, tell me your story, and thank you very much, bye-bye. Uh, a lot of them you get to know so well that if they want you to be there, and they let you know that too, by not telling you not to come, I might put it like that. Um, you'll you'll go, you'll go and be there. Funerals, funerals they prove nothing. You'll meet a person who maybe was killed tragically, and the church will be overflowing, and the yard too. But look, three months later, it's all forgotten, except by the family. The family don't forget, but life goes on. The big funeral. Big funeral is only for two days, and the small funeral uh, doesn't matter. But uh, I couldn't forget him and some of the stories he told me. I remember one of them particularly. He said that in 1831, just beside the railway track, the West Clare railway track, the house is still there. Spooky looking old place, tis too. But in 1831, there was this fierce disturbance in the country. Land trouble, of course. You know, people had no land and the population was growing very rapidly at the time. And the white boys and the Terry Alts and a lot of different names. But they were looking for weapons and they attacked this house, Applevale House, which was owned by a man called Blood. <laughs> And they broke in, and he retreated upstairs, but they caught him and dragged him down into the yard 
where there was a, a pump, you know, pump. And by God, he, he was a big, strong man, it seems, and he grabbed a hold of the handle to try to pull it off to defend himself, but they beat him to death. And the, by all accounts that the newspapers had at the time, they beat his head flat and beat his brains onto the walls. They splattered his brains around the place. And they were caught and they were hanged within sight of the house, you know, that was British justice at the time, you know, just to make a, a, a site, you know, for the, the peasantry around, if this is what will happen to you too, if uh, they were named and they were, they were hanged. But your man anyway, he told me, oh, he had all the story, he had all the story. Now, that could have been written out, of, uh, read out of the newspapers, you know, of 1831. He might have had it there, but he had one fact that wasn't in the newspapers. And he told me it came down through the family because his great-grandfather was there. Now, Mickey was just 100, and his father was 95 when he died, so his great-grandfather could have been there. I think it was his great-grandfather, he said. And at the time... There'd be stalls and whiskey and apples and bread and whatever. You know, it was a big day, a hanging. And there'd be money to be made, you know, for, for it was a gala occasion. But on that occasion, nothing was sold. There was no drink. There was no nothing sold. Everybody was so disgusted at the hangings. Uh, they felt that the law had got it wrong or the wrong men were being hanged or whatever that the law was only hanging him just for the sake of a hanging had to take place. Nothing was sold. You know, that's the kind of memory he had. Uh, he was an amazing man. I used to call to him for the best part of 30 years, I was calling to him. And most people never knew that about Mickey at all. You know, they knew him as a yeah, kind of a... Mickey would come in and sing a song and he'd do a little bit of a dance. and But nobody knew him for the stories. Which is another, another what should I say, symptom of storytelling not being appreciated. If you sing a song, oh, jeez, no bother. Dance a step, oh, great, great. Stories? Mm -mm. Uh -uh. Storytelling has very much died. People don't have the, they don't have the patience to listen to any kind of a long story, you know. No way. It has to be the kind of stand-up comedy kind of thing, you know, quick... Mm, 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 mm. And it has to be funny. That's why I like to tell fairy stories and why people... Huh? Huh? And it catches their attention because this isn't the kind of thing they're used to at all. And don't smile. Look them in the eye and say, mm. And that makes them uncomfortable because... Is he for maybe real? Could he maybe be telling the truth here? <laughs> and of course, that's the kind of stuff that I got from the old people. And a lot of them experienced it themselves. And now, I can't say whether they did or not, but you judge that by the person who's telling you the stories. And if you know them well enough, some of these people you know, they experience something. And... If they're able to tell their story coherently enough and about a particular place and sometimes I have asked them to take me to the place and show me the exact spot and very often you'll find that ah, there's a fort there's a fort there or maybe a bush or something similar and then you can draw your own conclusions because a story like that you'll find fits into a much, much bigger pattern of Irish folklore so, would a person like that be inventing? No, no, because if they were, they'd be a professional folklorist. And these people are not professional folklorists, whatever else they are. Their stories do fit into what a professional folklorist would know, like that, like that. So, there is something about these. I remember another man down near Shannon Airport. Holy God, he was, he was a mine of information like that. He now, he is one of the ones who absolutely believed in what he was talking about. 
you wouldn't shake his opinions. No chance. And if you tried, you'd get the road. You'd get the road very, very quick. If you laughed. Uh-uh. Other people, you could... Well, I wouldn't laugh. That'd be unmannerly. That'd be very unmannerly because in a house like that, you're a person's guest. The least you can do is hold your laughter or bollocksology until you get outside the gate and do what you like then. But you don't. You don't. You're, you're a guest in a person's house. And uh, I, I wouldn't laugh anyway because most of these people, they're most of them. Most of them very, very interesting and intelligent people in their own way. And there's different kinds of intelligence, as you well know. But some are clearer than others in their theories and whatever, but uh, all interesting people in their own way. This book I have here now in my hands, long ago by Shannon Side, the first book that I wrote by one of the people that I got so many of those stories from. He spent 30 years inside in that mental hospital there in Ennis, Our Ladies. Uh, I used to visit this man every Sunday until finally this book long ago by Shannon Said came out and he was so proud of it. He was so proud of it, Jimmy Armstrong. And when I brought that book into him, he, you know, he was, it was his proof, you know, that I'm not crazy, I'm not crazy. And I gave him a copy, but of course it was his book. And of course every Sunday after that, the book was gone. He had given it away. Could I give him another one? Of course I did, and another one, and another one, and another one, and another one. Because, you know, it was the proof that, look, I am somebody. And, well, Jimmy, God rest him, Jimmy is dead quite, quite a long time now, but the book is there, and the book is still there, and he got his, he got his name mentioned. Uh, and why not? Because they're all his stories. But one of them, especially, it stands out. Uh, they all stand out, because there was great fairy stories and all here. But this one here, Roguery and Nonsense, I, I put it under the chapter heading, and it was this. The day before yesterday, about 40 years ago, I got an empty letter of an old hag's death. I was so delighted at the sad news that every tear that fell from my small toe would split six feet of rock or set a meal going. I got a fit of running with my two shin bones in my pockets and my head under my arm for 16 miles, every minute sitting down until I met John Dervis, the coachman, driving 16 dead asses under an empty steam coach loaded with two roasted millstones, 17 man o' wars and half-baked paving stones. I went into Bernard Wang's and I asked him could he give me any account or information about the, sh the shower of all hags that fell next week. He said he couldn't, but John Manx could. I asked him where did John Manx live. He told me he lived in the round square house beyond all parts of the three flying asses up and down a street where a mad dog bit a hatchet and where the pigs fight for stirabout. I crossed into a small village about the size of Dublin where I saw a man running off with a load of chimneys on his back. He had a colic on his big toe, a toothache on his shin bone and a headache at the back of his knee. I sent for a coach to convey him to a doctor's shop where I ordered a physic of 17 quarts of pigeon's milk, 18 pounds of frog's butter, 19 pints of eel's bastings, 70 rogue's kidneys, a robin boiled into rags. I mixed them up together and I boiled them into a, in a leathern, wooden, iron, calico pot. After he had taken the physic, I brought him to a hospital where he got a fit of coughing for 18 days and 18 nights without stopping. After this he threw up strikers, seekers, hikers, foxhounds, greyhounds, harehounds, cud dogs, lap dogs and spaniels, and they all marched off to St Helena to bring back Napoleon Bonaparte, and they'll be back on the 80 12th, the hungriest month of the year. There was an awful fight three weeks and a half below Dublin between a mail coach and a man of war, firing boiled oyster shells, stewed lapstones and roasted wigs at each other, and twenty miles of the sea got burned between them. I then went up in a castle, eleven to twelve storeys high, and I never fell till I broke the lip lap of my liver against the sharp edge of a pawnbroker's wig. I was bidding farewell to John Dervis, the coachman, when he told me I shouldn't go, until he showed me more of the wonders. 
The first wonder he showed me was six little girls and six little boys playing hide-and-seek under a cock of hay made with stones. Another wonder he showed me was a cow going up backwards up a poplar tree to rob a magpie's nest. Another one he showed me was himself and his eldest son thrashing tobacco into peas, and one of the peas jumped through a ditch and killed a dead dog that was barking at a purple cat that was dying at the other side. The ditch was only as long as twas St. Patrick's Day to America. These were followed by four cripples who lost their heads armed in a dike at the Battle of Waterloo. I thought myself to run faster than any of them, so I put my two shin bones in my pockets and my head under my arm and I ran over bogs of butter and bog holes of buttermilk until I came to the Curra of Kildare where I struck my toe against a bridge and knocked it down and then the shower of old hags fell into the river and got burned in the blaze of cold water and now they're up in Dublin making straw hats out of dead deal boards. And how in the name of Christ he remembered all of it, I do not know, because it is such... Is it sensible nonsense or nonsensible sense? I do not know. He was a gas man, Jimmy. But I suppose the misfortunate man, he had plenty, plenty time to be thinking about it, like so many people in that place, and those places all over the country. (laughs) 